much. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Great. Um, thank you very much to the organising committee for the invitation to be here. It's delightful to be among colleagues in the UK. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the important work that Vera has done in the early childhood space over many years, and the important work of many Vera members in contributing to that really important early childhood space. So thank you, and I hope that we have continued cooperations in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, I'd like to share with you this morning some work that we've been doing, Bob, Bob Perry and I and other colleagues have been doing over many years, trying to reframe the conversations we have as children start school. Trying to look at ways of acknowledging the strengths that children and their families might exhibit as they start school, rather than some of the focus areas recently which have been on, on deficit discourses. And I'll talk about them as readiness discourses in a whole range of ways. So, <clears throat> I'd like to provide a little bit of an overview of starting school in Australia some discussion about some of the political interest, particularly in Australia, about readiness and transition, offer some challenges and some definitions about both of those two terms, share with you a position statement that was developed with a range of researchers and policy makers as well as educators, and then share some examples and draw some conclusions. <coughs> so I have a plan. If you start to go to sleep, I'll probably change it. <laughs> Okay, starting school in Australia. I know there are many Australians in the audience and it's tempting to give a simple overview of what it's like in Australia, but let me try. Um, despite having a federal um, interest in education, the responsibility for school education rests with states and territories. And that's of relevance because we recently have the very first national school curriculum in Australia but various states and territories feel the need to tweak that to their individual circumstances, so it doesn't necessarily look exactly the same from state to state. Early childhood settings um, involve both state and federal responsibilities, and that brings a range of both challenges and advantages, perhaps. The compulsory starting school age in Australia is six years, but many children will start school before that age. Partly that's because different states and territories set the minimum age at which children may enter school. I live in the state of New South Wales, um, and there our children start school in January, end of January, provided they turn five by July of that year. So they can be aged four and a half. Ten kilometres away in the state of Victoria, they can start school if they turn five by the end of April. So they're four years and nine months when they start school. So there are slight variations like that. Early childhood education is non-compulsory and is administered separately, regulated separately from compulsory education. Even though we have some departments of education that are responsible for all early childhood and primary education, there's still a different regulation system for schools and early childhood services. Just to give you an indication of some of the state-by-state -state differences, we have different terms that are used across the country for that first year of school. So if you start school in New South Wales, you attend kindergarten. If you start school in Victoria, you attend prep. And the year before school is called kindergarten. Um, we're going to try and keep the terminology simple and it is preschool and school. But it's an illustration of the variation we have, even though we do have some consistency. We've had a great deal of both reform in education in the last decade or so. The Council of Australian Governments, which is a group made up of state and territory education departments working in cooperation with the Commonwealth Government, committed in 2009 that by 2020 all children would have the best start in life to create a better future for themselves and the nation. Part of the elements of that commitment were to look at what in Australia is called universal access, different <coughs> from your universal access in the UK, but our interpretation of universal access is that children in the year before school would have access to 15 hours of preschool per week, delivered by a university qualified early childhood teacher, and depending on the service type and family with financial resources, 
that would be subsidised. Not free, but necessarily subsidised. So we have had some movement, particularly in the state of New South Wales recently, where the state government is looking to boost that to 30 hours of access. But across the nation, 15 hours of preschool is deemed to be um, a universal access entitlement. We've also had a great deal of change in terms of the focusing on the quality of early childhood services. We have a national quality agenda, which includes a national quality framework, which has a unified quality and regulatory system that's applicable across the country and across service types. One of the elements of the national quality framework that's been really important is the very first early childhood curriculum framework. Belonging, being and becoming, the early years learning framework for Australia is a major step towards looking to, to, to have educational quality highlighted in Australian early childhood settings. Um, and of course we have a range of reg regulatory systems to, um, to administer the national quality framework. Alright. There is particular attention on preschool. As I said, universal access refers to the year before school and there are considerable aims across the country to have above 95% of children participating in, in preschool education in the year before school. And so there's a great deal of focus on how, how are we doing in that and, and we are doing pretty well nationally although there are pockets in the country where preschool attendance is not nearly as high as some of our um, administrators would like. But part of this, this interest in starting school and part of the interest in universal access to preschool um, is very clearly tied to the worldwide emphasis on early childhood education as being the ultimate long-term investment. And that positions early childhood education in particular ways. We've seen a strong focus on both readiness and transition. <coughs> and lately, in Australia, we've seen a focus on promoting children's readiness being equated with a quality preschool program. And preschool attendance, again, in some national data released earlier this year, is being linked to improved scores on national testing, particularly year three. If I look particularly at readiness, <coughs> this graph appeared in some statistics earlier this year and reports a 2013 study that basically is looking at a causal link between attendance at a quality preschool and scores on the year three NAPLAN tests. It's a, a really interesting term that preschool attendance is now being linked to long-term outcomes as measured on NAPLAN. And if you follow some of the um, debate in Australia recently, we know that the NAPLAN testing has not received a great deal of good press, but the link still is being made, that attendance and quality preschool is going to improve cognitive outcomes later on. And clearly that raises, well for me, it raises a whole range of questions. Um, it's about what is the role then of preschool? What constitutes quality? When we look at quality, do we look at the curriculum? Do we look at outcomes? Do we look at standards? How do we position the child if we equate attendance at a quality preschool as benefiting later test scores? Do we position children as that future citizen or that future employee? Do we position the child in universalist discourses of development? Do we look at what it means to be prepared and ready as we expect children to meet some standards? be able to enter school and therefore develop the outcomes that are appropriate according to this um, measure. And, and what if the child doesn't attend preschool? Does that necessarily mean that they're going to start behind the brain of everybody else? Readiness is, is a fascinating concept. Um, although we seem to apply only part of the definition of readiness in our conversations about young children. The most com comprehensive definition of readiness comes from the work in the US in the 1990s, where the three elements have been identified as children's readiness, school's readiness for children, as well as elements of family and community readiness. 
no prizes for guessing which element we focus most on. We do sometimes see the rhetoric about the importance of schools being ready for children, but I think the reality is that it's often much easier to measure children than it is to try and work out what it is we mean by schools being ready for children. And the notion of having family and community supports that encourage learning is incredibly important. But again, there's less agreement about what that might be and what they might look like. The challenge, I find a whole range of challenges when we look at children's readiness and focus specifically on children's readiness. Some of the very early work we did in the late 1990s um, involved talking with parents and teachers and community members about children's readiness. And the results have not changed a great deal since then. But there seems to be an incredible emphasis on the youngest members in the transition being the ones that have to change the most. We think often of children existing in isolation, but are they responsible for their own readiness? We also sometimes seem to forget that schools are not culturally neutral spaces. <coughs> Once we start to define children as ready, we can necessarily find children who are unready. We start to think about how readiness might be assessed and by whom. It's very easy to equate readiness with age and maturity. Given the various starting school ages in Australia, it's often a conversation I have with educators who say, why can't they all just come at the same time? Why can't they all come when they're five? And I think that's fine, but do we assume that all five-year-olds are the same? <coughs> Focusing on children's readiness only seems also to forget the importance of relationships and interactions as children's readiness seems to develop over time. In Australia in particular, we've noticed a significant change as educators talk about the importance of readiness. And that's seen very clearly in some work we did um, Again, starting in the late 1990s and doing some comparisons. We started having a whole range of conversations with educators and with what we thought was an icebreaker question. The question is, what are the first five things you think of when you think of a child starting a school? It was meant to be an icebreaker, but actually turned out to be a very revealing question. Looking at the data from the, the whole range of the studies, we were able to identify a range of categories of things that people thought were important. They talked about skills. They talked about adjustment, being able to settle in. They talked about children's dispositions, how they felt about being at school. They talked about the educational environment. They talked about the importance of knowledge. They talked about family issues, physical issues, and children in particular talked about rules. When we administered this survey in 1998 to 2000, these are the things, these are the categories that are deemed important. It was actually reassuring when we looked at the educators that we spoke to, that most of them thought that children's adjustment was the most important thing as they started school. And adjustment meant things like being able to cope in a group environment, feeling comfortable mixing with others in a classroom setting, feeling like they started to belong in the school environment. We were quite reassured that knowledge didn't assume incredible, incredible importance, um, and that skills, if you like, were there, but they were not seen as the most important things. When we administered the survey in 2013-14, we see a noticeable shift. We see that adjustment isn't seen as nearly as important, but skills are there. And I could probably understand that if we were talking about things like executive functioning skills or self-regulation skills, but we're not. We're talking about skills like being able to hold a pencil, skills like being able to cut. I'm, I'm surprised at how scissors have become a real picture. <laughs> <laughs> but being able to cut is a really big deal. <laughs> so we're talking about minute skills. We're talking about the sorts of skills that you think you might acquire in an environment where you get a chance to practice them. But what we're starting to see are people saying, I really don't think these kids should be coming to school unless they can cut properly. <laughs> However, <laughs> conversations still to have. I think what it reflects is a shift in the 
public rhetoric as well as in the private rhetoric about what it is um, that happens in that first year of school. Okay, but there's also been a quite a lot of political interest in transition. Again, the same collab documents when they're looking at a national early childhood agenda talk about a positive start to school leading to greater and ongoing connection with school and how that can be identified as a factor in disrupting cycles of disadvantage. And so we're talking about transition here as, as an ongoing process and the importance of children feeling like they belong at school and hopefully continuing to engage them. The Closing the Gap strategy in Australia, which is seeking to improve the educational outcomes of Indigenous children, also focuses on transition as a way of supporting and encouraging those contexts um, as a way of overcoming disadvantage. And transition is also seen as a time to look at continuity across curriculum. Because what I didn't say is that we have a national school curriculum, that we have a national early years learning framework, but again, you won't be surprised to know that they don't speak the same language um, or use the same terms or reflect the same outcomes. So perhaps transition is a time to look at building some continuity. So as I said, COAG is very supportive of looking at transition. The idea that improved transition to school leads to improved <coughs> educational employment, health and wellbeing outcomes. So transition is also on the agenda. <coughs> However, we also live in an age of expectation where once you start to look at transition, it's often expected that some groups of children will have a more problematic transition than others. And again, no points for guessing what those groups might be. But as indicated here, they tend to be, well, the one that's not listed there are the younger children. So the children who are young, the boys, the children from families that might be considered as living in disadvantaged circumstances, children who have disability or special education needs, and children who have a language other than English. But it's important to consider what we might mean by transition. Transition, in the in a very broad definition that we use constantly in our work, has a very broad focus of look at Robos work where she talks about transitions as being tied to individuals change their role in a community, or a community structure. And when you think of transition in that sense, we all engage in transitions throughout our life. If we change our role in a community structure, that often means that we look at ourselves in a different way. We change our identity, our status, our role. And certainly that's the case as children start school. They suddenly become a school student, not a child. Their role changes, they're expected to undertake particular roles in the classroom that they might not be expected to do outside, and their status certainly changes. We've expanded on that a little to talk about transition as a time of both individual and social change, influenced by communities and contexts, and within these, the relationships, the identities, the agency, and the power of all involved. Because when we're looking at relationships over time, they can be quite complex and but transition offers us a really interesting opportunity to consider a range of different approaches and different ideas. And I'd like to share some of them with you. We can think of transition as a movement, as moving between contexts and across contexts. We all make a number of transitions throughout our lives. We make some age-related transitions. Sometimes we're expected to do it there only once. We expect to start school only once. We expect to start high school only once. But other transitions we make daily. We might make the transition from home to school, to life to school, here and back to home. So we might make some vertical transitions as well as some horizontal transitions. You might have a range of traditions to mark changes of transition. But the German um, starting school tradition is to have the great big kind of models and movies that's delivered to the child as they start school. I think in Australia our only real, real tradition is to have multiple photos of the child in their school uniform and the possible guys in place. <laughs> but you can have bigger transitions. Our traditions do mark transitions. One of the discussions I've been having with educators is thinking about transition as a rite of passage. And while that's adopting an anthropological stance that may not always be relevant, it can prompt some thinking about when transition might occur. When does transition start? 
When does it finish? Sometimes we're told that transition finishes on the first day of school. Well, that's, that's a bit of a So when, when does it start and when does it finish? But um, some of our Swedish colleagues have been looking very much at using the rights of passage framework and particularly looking at how children might become an ex-preschooler. How, how do you mark the idea that you've left preschool and you're now moving on to something else? They have some delightful examples of children, both metaphorically and literally, jumping out the window and saying, well, that's it, I'm done with preschool now, I don't belong there anymore. But, a notion of if we unpack transition, then maybe it's worth looking um, at different phases, like how do you separate from some context? What do you do in between times? What does it mean to become incorporated into the new scene and what might that look like? Um, again, you probably have it here, but we have a lot of children in Australia who in the summer holidays don't quite know whether they've started school or not, because they've left preschool, but they haven't really gone to anything else just yet. Transition occurs in a range of other theoretical contexts that also provide some fodder for our thinking about transition. We can look at life course theory, <coughs> the idea that there are many different social contexts and social histories that come together when we consider transition. The notion that there are transformational processes. How do you change and how do others, how do the views of others change when you transform through transition? Some really quite fascinating work about border crossing. Are schools and private school settings and families and communities forming structured borders? Are there political borders? How do we move? And again, if we're looking at the timing of transition and what that might mean, the, the really interesting um, approach that says transition follows a rupture. And if a rupture involves something like leaving preschool, then the transition can't really occur until we start to think about the processes that follow that. What all of those do is set up conversations with our educators about how you might plan for transition and how you incorporate rather than expecting children to turn up at school on day one and that's it, you move on from there. It's about thinking about the processes that occur along the way. You'll no doubt be familiar with the ecological model of transition that's used in a great deal of research that looks at the importance of contexts, the connections among the contexts and the relationships of the human time. All of this is to say that transition is more than about children having a specific set of skills or abilities and knowledge as they move into the school context. We also have a lot to learn from our Indigenous colleagues who talk about the importance of transition not necessarily as a one-way journey, but they also have referred to the fire stick period, an Aboriginal term for a stick that is kept alight to ensure the availability of fire as a way of suggesting that culture isn't something you leave behind. You take something with you wherever you go, and that influences what happens in the future. It's also <coughs> been important for us to look at who's transition. We focus very much on children, but transitions happen for families too. I don't know whether you can think about, or maybe I have to think back, um, if you've had children starting school, how much things changed for you? How much the family needed to undergo a transition to be able to manage the new situation? So it's a transition for children, it's a transition for educators, it's a trans transition for families. And we can see all sorts of changes that happen for us individually, in our interactions, and in our contexts. So transition can be quite a complex series of processes that contribute to how children and families and educators engage in the first year of school. Transition involves processes of both continuity and change. Some things stay the same, but some things change. We've recently been involved in a project where educators talked to us about how they wanted to provide, I think it was an invisible, seamless transition for children. So they move from preschool to school. And, and my question was, but does that mean children wake up when they're at school and they haven't really realised that they've made a transition? <coughs> I think it's important where we can to promote continuity, but not to underestimate the importance of change. If you talk to children about starting a school, what they're interested in is becoming a big kid. Big kids get to do certain things, they engage in certain ways, they actually want us to acknowledge the change as well as to support the continuity. Okay, 
So, so a few years ago, we were interested in looking at how we might change some of the conversations about STEM in school. We were interested in what Shira talked about as the language of possibility, where transition in this case was recognised as involving multiple narratives and social practices which valued diversity and where the knowledge and power relations surrounding transitions were able to support pedagogies of difference. Just a small one. We were looking to try and pull together the worldwide research on transition, and it was quite a lot, trying to synthesise it into a position statement that might influence policy and research, trying to provoke ways of changing the conversation around educational transition and readiness, looking for some way to develop something that might be relevant for the Australian context, but also relevant internationally. We were lucky enough to be able to get some funding to pull together 16 of the world's leading researchers in transitions and to bring them to Australia. And that's no mean feat, I have to tell you. <laughs> but we were able to use what we called a modified Delphi approach, where we had a fairly intensive think tank, developed some principles and some ideas, were able to trial that in workshops with policymakers, to trial that in workshops again with educators, to try and spend some time reaching a consensus to put together a document that reflected a range of views about the importance of transition. We were able to engage a graphic artist to try and illustrate what we were trying to say. And whilst there are some shortcomings in this diagram, I have to say that it's become very recognisable and very well used. It's an interesting way to prompt us to think about the ways in which children come to school and some of the experiences they might have. We often use this diagram in workshops with educators as a brainstorming session, and I have to say that the most interest comes from the guy in the hang glider. <laughs> and we can't work out whether that's um, a parent hovering over the top <laughs> or somebody just checking that everybody's safe. But it doesn't actually matter because it starts that conversation about what we might expect as children make their way to school. Some of the guiding principles for the position statement were to reconceptualise transition to school in the context of social justice, human rights, including children's rights, educational reform and ethical agendas, and to look at the established impact of transition to school on children's ongoing wellbeing, learning and development. And in doing so, to look at the range of educational entitlements children have as they start school. Looking at transition to school being defined, as a dynamic process of continuity and change as children move into the first years of school. Importantly, looking at transition being a process that occurs over time, beginning well before children start school, and extending to the point where children and families feel a sense of belonging to the school environment and where that belonging is recognised by educators. That's quite challenging because that could mean that some children are still engaged in transition processes two, three, four terms after starting school. It's not assuming that everybody will feel like they belong on day one. It's a much more involved process. <coughs> we have a number of constructs that support the transition statement, and they are that transition is characterised by opportunities, aspirations, expectations and entitlements. And the words were chosen very carefully. Um, and entitlement is not a word that's used often in education or settings in Australia, but we thought it was particularly relevant. I'm, I'm going to show you some examples. You'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to read them, but I'm just going to show you what some of the statement looks like. It looks at how we might provide opportunities, for example, for children to continue to shape their identities and extend their existing knowledge, skills and understandings to interactions with adults, peers and family. The document is quite readily available, so if you'd like to read it in more detail, I'm quite happy to share the, the access information. But we looked at aspirations. As families look forward to positive educational outcomes for their children, both school and social and academic. And the notion that all families have that aspiration, <laughs> despite their circumstances. We looked at expectations so that educators expect to have support and appropriate professional recognition as they create positive learning environments and partnerships with families and other educators 
as professionals. It may be different here, but sometimes in Australia we don't have the sort of professional relationships between early childhood educators and school educators that reflect that kind of professional recognition. But we also look at entitlements, for example, for communities, as if communities are entitled to regard themselves as essential contributors to children's education. So a statement to try and reposition transition through opportunities, aspirations, expectations and entitlements. The position statement has been used in a range of different ways. We were thank, are lucky, to, lucky to be contracted by the Federal Department of Education a few years ago to produce a document to support reflective practice and effective transition to school. Um, and just as examples, in working around the country to work with educators in different contexts, we were able to identify a range of practices and situations that both reflected those pillars, but also shared some really interesting practice about supporting transition. It's also been used to develop a reflection tool to encourage people to reflect on and evaluate their own transition practices. And that's not something that happens very often. Um, people tend not to be fairly involved in evaluating transition practices and if they are, it's often not from the perspective of children or families or sometimes communities. We've also been lucky enough to work with a number of our colleagues um, who have been able to translate the document into a number of different languages and to use it in their own contexts. But let me try and pull it together. Um, I've tried to the problem with readiness, and that's probably a little bit wicked in a sense, in that I'm not going to argue that children knowing things or understanding things or being able to do things is a problem when they start school. I'm going to argue that the problem is that we expect all children to be able to do the same things in the same way at the same time, and when our educational programs are premised on that particular view. So what we find when we look at children starting school is that the focus tends to be remaining on children's readiness only. Like I said, we tend not to have lots of conversations about how schools will be ready for children, but we do have lots of conversations about how children need to be ready for school. You can buy all sorts of preparation materials to help children become ready for school. But those views, if you like, assume that there's a standard set of readiness expectations and that everyone defines readiness in the same way. It also assumes that the culture, it ignores, I suppose, that the cultural context of school is such that some children will more easily or readily be defined as ready than others. And you know that some children will fit into the school environment very easily, and it's quite easy to label those as ready, and by definition, the others as unready. And whose fault is it that they're unready? It's someone else's. We know that focusing on readiness only is also providing a situation that doesn't necessarily recognise the strengths and the knowledges of those children who don't fit the standard notions of readiness. And I think that takes us to that area where sometimes it's easy to assume that children starting school don't know anything, when in fact they know and have learned a great deal, it just may not be the same thing as the value in a school context. We know that readiness assessments can be very narrow, and as I said, the ones I've seen lately have an incredible focus on that. And we know that readiness is rarely assessed over time in the context of relationships. And again, we all know that children are most likely to show what they can do to the largest extent when they're in relationships with people they know and trust and in a context that's familiar. And that tends not to be the case in which readiness assessments are we know that readiness discourses frame the role and the purpose of early childhood education as preparation for school. You're a good early childhood teacher if your children are deemed to be ready for school. And that process of schoolification worries a great deal of us as early childhood educators because we believe that early childhood education is a separate and different phase of education. We believe it shouldn't have to be just like school. Looking at schoolification means that we often fail to recognise the traditions, the philosophies and the histories of early childhood education and the professionalism of early childhood educators who are often working incredibly hard to build play-based programs for the sake of the children for here and now, not necessarily as preparation for school. 
we also know that reframing the focus from children's readiness to deliberate transition can emphasise those processes of relationship building over contexts and over time that are critical to recognising the strengths of the children in the world. We'd argue that considering transitions in terms of opportunities, aspirations, expectations and entitlements offers us a strengths-based strategy to celebrate the children and the diversity of our children as they start school, mm -hmm. rather than trying to fit children into the one box. And whenever I'm in doubt about the differences among the children as they come to school, I'm taken back to the photo of my son's very first soccer team. Children, same community, same age, many similar contexts, but they're all incredibly different. If they're all incredibly different in shape and size and build and speed and finesse, why would we expect them to be similar in any other way? Why would we expect them all to be ready in the same way at the same time? Thank you. Well, thanks so much to Sue for, for that uh, fascinating uh, talk there, which brought uh, so many connections, I'm sure, to, to, to everybody here. Um, thinking about uh, transitions uh, in an international sense, very profoundly international, transnational analysis developing here, uh, which is relevant to many, many different kinds of, kind of contexts. Uh, social context and, and, and local context. Certainly about starting school, and, and during the talk I, I began to have this uh, startling memory of myself as a five-year-old and then starting school with this label, a name label around my neck, and telling everybody to look all like, all like. <laughs> about starting school itself, but also about troubling ideas about, uh, about theory, about uh, 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 our, our, our notions of transition, um, creative links, um, and, and ideas which I, I think we will want to debate, um, and about our social practices uh, in general, and also about the, the role of the pursuit fantastically reminded us about, about families and, and schools and communities and, and the, these wider connotations of, of transitions to school. Uh, but those are just a few particular thoughts that have came to my mind. And I'm sure colleagues have got many, many different questions and, and, and ideas to, to raise with you so over the next few minutes. Who'd like to start? Thanks. Um, so I just heard said, um, thanks to you and to the Ask Fellow Australian, so I guess found it particularly interesting as well. Um, I'm interested, so as you sort of explained, um, Australia has a federal system, but um, often state is, um, education is controlled sort of by the state. Um, and so in that way, it's, it's, a, it's funny because it's quite a fragmented system, and yet uh, I think, you know, the states, there is a lot of continuity because of its under state control, whereas um, from my experience here, I've lived five years, and I think the system is, education system, it, despite it being quite small, it's really fragmented, like there's, there's lots of different academies and this and that, and it's a, a very strange system, and I wondered, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess I was, in terms of early childhood, I, I guess I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the sort of implications for that, for, for England and their, like their system. I think that'd be a little bit brave of me to suggest that we I think um, across the world we have a history, particularly of early childhood systems being fragmented because they've grown up in different ways, in different contexts, for different purposes. Um, and in some ways that's the strength of early childhood services, but it's also the weakness. Um, so I, I, I would be very loath to offer suggestions for Europe, except to say that I think sometimes we're all in the same boat. And, Maybe instead of trying to reinvent the wheel in each country, we have a lot to learn from each other. Thank you very much for very interesting points and questions that you raised. Um, what is your view on um, the variations in start age or compulsory education? What's the point about the differences across Australia? The differences in the case of children's arts and age of four and age of five? And could be new and there are many differences. It's not a problem for children to start compulsory education at age of six. Um, I, 
think sometimes we become fixated on age, whereas I think I'd rather see our focus on what happens in those first years of school. So I'm, I'm not too worried about saying there's a perfect age or a different age. I'd be much keener to say, well, what happens in that first year? How can whatever we have in that first year of school be reflective of the children, their interests, their relevance? How do we, how do we have the best possible curriculum and context for children regardless of their age? Because I think once, I mean, all ages are arbitrary cutoffs anyway, and we know that children are not going to be the same regardless of the age. But I think our focus on, on age takes it away from how do we make sure the first year of school is that incredibly welcoming, hopefully play-based, <coughs> and responsive year that it could be, rather than saying, well, everyone needs to be a certain age because as soon as they start school, they're going to do this formal academic program and that's it. Thank you. It makes sense. Um, it is my fear, though, that when the compulsory education starts, the teachers are not taking very seriously and tend to teach very formal education. And I think we have to be honest and say that teachers are facing incredible pressures. Um, we, we've got to be really careful not to say that, that teachers are doing you know, this in you know, a deliberate attempt to harm children. Um, what we have is an accountability system that really forces teachers to behave in certain ways, or at least to believe they have to behave in certain ways. Perhaps we need to support those first, we need to support those first year school teachers in other ways um, that reflects both their professional identity and their ability to create different learning environments. Um, in England, we've got the prospect of baseline testing, which has been piloted this year. Um, Scotland's already P1 testing. Um, but that defines what the children need to do and what's valued. So, uh, have you got any comment on that? Um, except let's change the assessment. Um, um, I think there are good challenges. Um, in many states of Australia, children are also doing um, early school assessments. Um, and they differ across different contexts and they're being used as, as the baseline, as I suppose here, to look at how children are evaluated and, and the ways in which children develop. I think it, it's easy to see from a very broad view about how that might be useful, but I think that loses the focus on the differences we know among children. And what started off in, in a number of states of New South Wales, oh, sorry, a number of states of Australia, including New South Wales, as an interesting attempt for teachers to spend time getting their children has actually become a, a pre-starting school assessment um, that we challenge in all sorts of ways because it's undertaken in contexts that are unfamiliar with someone the kid doesn't know um, about things that they probably haven't met before. And I think we've got to wonder about the relevance of the baseline assessment and I'm not sure of the details about the English version but wonder about what we're trying to do and whether or not that's the purpose we see of the education we're engaging in. I don't know that it's an argument we're going to win, but I think it's we've got to keep questioning what it is we're doing, particularly what we're seeking to do with assessment of young children. Um, we know that on a good day, a five-year-old can be fantastic, and on a bad day, they're not. Um, so what are we trying to do? And I think we've got to be realistic about the implications of that. Um, I don't know where your, where your baseline assessment is going, but I think we've got to be asking questions about that nature of early assessment that locks kids into all sorts of uh, particular parts and trajectories. Sorry, I have no answer. I think well as well. <laughs> Sue, thank you. Your final picture said it all, really, didn't it? And just to acknowledge that Pira has done a very interesting piece around peer basement assessment and specify its position. But going back to that picture, I wonder what the implications could be of the, the position that you've been setting out and that you've achieved with colleagues from around the world, I think, uh, for teacher training. I mean, how do we uh, strengthen young teachers' confidence, early years teachers in particular, in dealing with these different developmental trajectories that children are on in those years? I think that's a really interesting question because I think the first step is, is encouraging our teacher education students to expect difference and to realise that even though kids are going to be the same age, there is going to be incredible difference. And instead of positioning that as a problem, to start to see that as an opportunity. 
So in our first years of school classes, we could have children from age four and a half to six. And the first thing often people say is, oh my gosh, what a problem. I think if you can turn that around and say, oh my gosh, what an opportunity, um, then I think you're changing the mindset a little. And I think that's what we're trying to do is change that mindset that says, oh, okay, we have a child who can't come, who perhaps hasn't got a good pencil grip, but that doesn't mean that their whole educational career is wrecked from the beginning. We can actually do something about that. And I think that's tied to that notion of increasing professionalism um, and trusting our educators. Um, we know that our early childhood educators, both in primary school and school settings, can do an incredible job. So how do we support them to do that? I think we first of all encourage them to look for things like opportunities, and second, we encourage them to trust their professionalism. We say, you have a good background, you have a good understanding, you know what to do, how can you enact that in practice, and how can we support you do that, rather than deciding that there's a problem from the word go and we can't address them. So I think it's the change in the mindset, and I know that sounds really simple, but it's that approach of saying, well, let's not think of it as a deficit, let's not think of it as a problem, let's look at the ways it offers us opportunities to engage with children and families and with our professional, other professional educators in really interesting ways. So it's the change in the mindset, I think, and we can do that as future educators by the way we approach the problems that we um, encounter in different in settings and families. Sorry, I microphone. Um, I did actually. I think your last response might have answered my question. I wanted to problematize a little bit that notion of pedagogies of difference, and you mentioned it a few times. And you also mentioned it in your response to the previous uh, question. In a society like Australia, which is very multicultural, and from the perspective of a child probably wants to be the same as everybody else and not highlighting differences. Can you grapple a little bit more deeply with this idea of pedagogies of difference? What do you mean by it? What does it mean in an Australian context, which is multicultural? Um, kids want to be like their peers. I, I think that's an interesting question. I'll try to answer the comments. I think they do want to be like their peers, but I think they also want to be recognised as individuals. Um, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think um, if we're looking at a pedagogy of difference, that means that I, I would suggest that we need to have the time to build the relationships with children so that we get to know who they actually are, where their, their interests lie, their understandings, their skills, their knowledge. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think, I think children's wanting to fit in, wanting to feel like they belong, doesn't necessarily mean that they don't want people to recognise their differences. And I think we can do both. Um, I'm reminded of some of the early work we did talking with parents about what they were seeking in their educational context for children when they started school. And the parents had a really clear dualism in a sense. They wanted their child to fit in. They didn't want their child to be a morning child, a difficult child, a late child, a messy child but they desperately wanted somebody to know that their child was special. And I think we can translate that to children. They want to fit in, but they also want somebody to know that there's something special about them, that they can connect with others. So I think we can do both. I think we can recognise difference. We can encourage that sense of belonging, but that doesn't have to mean that we take away that importance of individualism. And I know that's a really good answer, but I'm not sure that I've got time to go on 